Welcome to Green Building Matters, the podcast that matters for green building professionals. Learn insight in green buildings as we interview today's experts in lead and well. We'll learn from their career paths, war stories, and all things green, because green building matters. And now our host, and yes, he has every lead and well credential, here's Charlie Cicchetti! Welcome to the next episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. I'm joined by a friend in South America, actually. So we're going to be talking to Francesca Mayer Martinelli, and she's the CEO of the Peru Green Building Council. So can't wait to compare and contrast what's happening in that part of the world as Fran is really pushing not just LEED, but other programs. So uh, Fran, thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, Charlie. Thank you. You know, let's, we always like to start these by just how did you get into kind of what you're doing today? But take us back. I understand from your bio, you studied some in the U.S., but you went back to South America. So can you kind of tell us a little bit about your studies, some of your early career, and what got you to leading the Peru Green Building Council? Yes, of course. So, well, I went to high school here in Peru. I did my whole high school, middle school, everything here in Peru. And then it's kind of crazy, actually. I played tennis. So I wanted to continue playing tennis. And our country is not the best with tennis. So I got a tennis scholarship uh, in South Carolina. And I played for this university called Commerce College, which is a liberal arts college. It's a small one, but it's a really good one. And I decided to study interior design. I always liked design and um, I thought it was going to be the perfect career for me. Halfway through that career, I realized that I actually loved doing research, everything related to Excel spreadsheets. And I was really lucky because one of my teachers actually had lived in Qatar and she was very influenced by the green movement around the world and everything sustainability related. So I finished college very early and I mean, I was really afraid to go back to Peru after living alone in the U.S. for five years. And I asked my family and they suggested I should do like a master's degree or something. And since I had already had my teacher's influence on sustainability, then I decided to go for a sustainable design and construction master's in New York, which was, of course, another radical change. Going from South Carolina to New York City, right. living and own in a tiny little apartment in the Upper East Side, which I love, of course. But <laughs> I was completely immersed in the sustainability movement. Totally loved it. All of my teachers were lead AP. I had no idea what lead meant at the beginning. <laughs> at the yeah. end of the of the master's degree, I even had my first accreditation. I was a lead with an associate by the end of the master's degree. I actually, it was the first one in my class and I got a little present from the teachers. So it was kind of weird because I never thought I would be working on what I'm doing right now. I thought it was going to be designing beach houses and like probably apartments and retail stores. But now I'm leaning with sustainability and working with the companies that actually do the beach houses and the retail stores, but in a completely different way. Uh, that's a great backstory, and I'm, I'm glad that you got to go to a couple of good colleges. But yeah, uh, rural South Carolina compared to uh, Manhattan, that's uh, that's a big difference. I love New York City. Uh, luckily, we get up there a good bit. So what about sustainability, though? Was it always a part, a way of life? I mean, because obviously, once you learned a little more about sustainable design and construction, you went all in on it. But, you know, Fran, tell us a little bit about, has that been a, a, an important part of your life, uh, even growing up? Yeah, I definitely think I always had some, I always had a green heart, even though I didn't express it as much at the beginning. I live in a house, I have a garden, so I always like to be outside. I like going outside of the city during the weekends, um, being around nature. I really liked nature and I liked how easy and how logical sustainable decisions actually were. When you think about sustainability and some of the strategies you do, they're actually logical things you have to do and implement in a project. Yeah, of course you have technology and everything, but it's it's very it's a very easy concept and it's a very logical concept. And it's uh, I started as I started getting more into it, more and more into sustainability. I started to realize that it was actually it's been with me throughout my life. Maybe not as strong as it is right now, 
but it definitely resonates with me what how my lifestyle was and what I wanted to do with my life. That's fantastic. A green heart. I, that's really yeah. cool. <laughs> Tell us, uh, we'd like to talk about careers. Everyone has an interesting career path to end up where they are today. Um, did you have any early mentors, anyone that really influenced you and, and maybe helped you along the way? Well, I don't know if I would call it a mentor. Or just but, inspirations. You know, sometimes, Fran, yeah. it's someone that <laughs> you sit down and you have coffee with often and they help guide you. But other times it's just someone that you really uh, <laughs> respect and you follow them and you're inspired by them. Someone that really inspired me, it's it's my mother. She, it sounds weird because when you think about your mom, you think about someone that um, is taking care of the household and cooking and, and so that. But my mom actually is a civil engineer and she loves what she does. She's probably one of the few women female engineers, uh, civil engineers here in Peru. There's a lot more right now, but when she was younger, she was probably one of the few ones. And she's very technical and very specific with what she does. But she had this thing where she would always tell me that the key to success was actually loving what you do, no matter what you do. But as long as you love it, you'll do it good and you'll be successful. And she loves what she does, even though nobody understands because civil engineering is really complicated. <laughs> but she really, really, she's really passionate about it. And I realized that I had to do something that I was passionate about in order to be successful and in order to enjoy it. Because just imagine waking up every single morning to do something that you don't actually love and feel really passionate about. It's just miserable. So I think in a way, she really influenced me into doing what I liked and what I felt that made me happy, even though sustainability wasn't a big thing in Peru five, 10 years ago, but I still went for it. And I think that's what it's helped me successful in what I do and feel happy about it. She sounds like a wonderful person in that early civil engineering experience. That's uh, I'm sure that, that rubbed off on you. Um <laughs> Let's talk about your role now as the CEO of the Peru Green Building Council. We had a chance to talk earlier. You're pretty busy. You've got a lot going on trying to not just advocate for lead, but a lot of other initiatives. So what are you working on right now? And uh, what's kind of important to the Peru Green Building Council? Well, we're always working on increasing our um, member base. We always want more companies to know more about the sustainable movement to educate themselves, to use the tools that we provide for them. If we talk about specific projects we are working right now, something very interesting and exciting we are doing right now is that we are actually working with the different municipalities in the city of Lima. We realize that a lot of people do sustainable projects because, yes, of course, you get water savings, and energy savings, and it's really good for marketing, but that, then it stops there. You, you needed something else. So... We think it's really important for the government to provide the framework and the right tools and to be aware of what's happening in the market and to provide incentives, actually. So we're working with these different municipalities in order to develop a set of incentives so that projects can be developed. And if they go for green buildings, if they go for specific certification systems, then they get these incentives. And it's really tricky with working with the government, but it's, it's starting to work pretty good. And there's a lot of new projects being developed using um, LEED or any other of the certification systems applicable here in Peru. And they get the incentives. Some of them do it because of the incentive. I know it's not the optimal, but others have done it because of the incentive. And then they realized that it wasn't that hard and that it's actually really positive for them, for the projects, for the users, for everyone. So it just becomes their way of working, their modus operandi. So um, that's a really exciting thing we are doing right now. And of course, everything related to LEED is actually really exciting for the country. We've had our first LEED uh, healthcare project being certified in December last year. It's a very nice hospital project in the city of Lima. And we we already have also two, I think, Two of them are already certified and one is about to be certified any minute soon, LEED Platinum Projects, which is also really exciting for us because that proves that LEED is not only not that expensive and not impossible. At the beginning, people thought that LEED was like, oh, very expensive and like only for some specific right. type of projects. 
But now that you see that we even have lead platinum projects, people are starting to say, okay, so this is not impossible. We can do this. Doable. Yeah. No, that project sounds amazing. First of all, congrats. And, uh, you know, I think no matter why we're taking our buildings for lead, the net result is it's better for the environment. But you're right. There's uh, different reasons for the business case to, to go through with the certification. Yeah. You know, we looked it up. There's 77 lead professionals in Peru. And, uh, you know, so I think there's on one hand, you've got some early adopters that are maybe promoting it like yourself. You have multiple credentials, Fran. And, uh, but then there's a lot of opportunity. And I know that's a big part of your role is to educate, to advocate. So who are some of those early uh, adopters in your region? Are there certain building types? Uh, you mentioned that's the first healthcare, but are there schools or office buildings? Which of those projects uh, are getting certified right now? And which ones do you think you know should be getting certified? I think the first buildings that started getting into lead certification were definitely the office buildings. That's like the prime office buildings that most of them host international companies that actually came to Peru and required being on a building that had a lead certification or some sort of sustainability certification. So that was probably one of the drivers that made a lot of office buildings to get into lead. Then it became a trend. You had your neighbor being lead certified and then the other one being lead certified. So you had to be lead certified if we're talking about the projects. And then I think the second group, the second really big group of projects that started getting certified was the universities. We have around 10 university buildings, maybe even more, that are already lead certified and around 10 more that are in the process. For a country like Peru, if we talk about 10, 10, 100, that's a lot. Actually, I know there's like 20. 5,000 or something lead certified projects in the U.S. And for us, 10 universities doing lead is a lot. If you think about the size of our country and that we are a very centralized country where everything happens in Lima, basically. So, yeah, they started doing lead because they realized that where you learn matters. Not, that's not only what you learn. Where you learn matters. And if they wanted to establish certain quality of teaching, and innovation, they, they had to go forward with these new buildings and do lead. So they started doing lead, they liked it. It was not that hard, they started getting to good levels. So now we have a lot of lead projects that focus on education, even schools right now. One of the lead platinums actually is a school, it's a high school. Oh wow, I love lead for schools. Um, I think yes. it's a great program where we focused on acoustics in the classroom, making sure Can your student, can your child hear the teacher okay? Is it a productive learning environment? So a lead platinum high school, that's where I want to be sending my kids. That's fantastic. Oh, you too. <laughs> This is fun. Uh, let's, let's talk about uh, a little bit more your career so far. You know, Fran, what would you say is your specialty or your gift? What, what are you best at so far in your career? Well, I don't want to brag, but I would like This to say... This is your one chance to brag. It's okay. <laughs> I would like to say speaking. As you've already noticed, I can speak for hours. People <laughs> shut me down. So I have absolutely no problem speaking in front of an audience. I love doing that, especially because I can share all of the knowledge I, I constantly get about sustainability and green buildings and green construction. So I try to participate in as many conferences as I can. Um, I try to do as many courses, as many trainings, everything that I can do, um, not only to talk, but to communicate what I know, which becomes really easy for me, I try to do it. So I would say that's my little, <laughs> my little thing. Uh, it's great. A lot of people are afraid of speaking. It's one of the biggest fears. Uh, but I should have known you'd said that because your LinkedIn profile picture is you with a microphone in front of a group. <laughs> you, are, you are a great speaker. Yeah, I mean, just let's let's talk a little bit more about just productivity. You've got a lot going on. So what, do you have any routines or rituals? How, how do you stay productive and what's helped you be successful? Well, like I mentioned earlier, I'm a big fan of Excel charts <laughs> so every single morning the first thing i do when i turn on my computer is i have my to-do list that i update every single day it tells me exactly what i have to do every single day and when to do it and something that's been really hard for me is to manage the time to always be uh, up to date with my emails answering emails and it's not always that easy sometimes i I, I go out for a meeting and then I come back and I have like 30 minute emails. 
and it, it's a really, it's a little tricky, but a, a little routine I have is getting very early into the morning to the office, checking my my to do list, and then okay, start working, working, working. But I always have to have a break at the middle of the morning, even it's, even if I'm between meetings, I need to have like a 15, 20 minute break. Just go around the park, maybe like, I don't know, like have coffee, come like an apple or whatever. I need to have that little break. When I come back from that little break, it's like refreshed. Do it again. Okay. A lot of new energy to do things one more time. Uh, you have to just make sure you're visualizing your day and look at the to-do list. So now we talked about languages before we got on the podcast today, Fran. And, and so tell me a little bit about as your day goes by, and especially as you're out advocating as the Peru Green Building Council, do you do more trainings in English or, or Spanish? or What's going on with the language barrier when it comes to lead and your day-to-day work? So like I told you um, a couple of minutes earlier, most of the training I do, most of the sessions we do, most of the, the classes and everything is in Spanish because the majority of the population here in Peru speaks Spanish. At the beginning, it was hard because lead was all in English. But now, since you can actually do the lead certification process completely in Spanish, and of course the practice tests and even the exam can be taken in Spanish, it's become a little easier for everyone else. For me, it's still a little tricky because a lot of the resources are still in English, so I still have to take the time to translate them and make sure that they're adaptable to our to our country, right? right? So yeah, most of it is in Spanish, although a lot of English going on uh, when we talk to the USGBC or the different GBCs around the world or at different companies that actually invest in the country and that are really focused on sustainability. But yeah, mostly everything we do is in Spanish. We actually have a a webinar next week that's going to be in English with the uh, cradle to cradle, but mostly everything we do is in Spanish. Okay. No, I was just curious. Um... Now, let's talk a little bit about the the Green Build Conference. I know uh, Mahesh, the CEO of the USGBC, is really trying to help grow lead internationally. Now there's Green Build Europe. There's going to be Green Build Mexico. I think you've even had some conferences in in your home country. So how how do conferences like that, uh, do you you go to those? And what are you trying to get out of going to a conference like that? Well, I try to go as many conferences I have I can, and the budget allows, of course, <laughs> internationally, yeah. not as many as I would wish to, of course. And what I like to take from those conferences, first of all, the networking, the contacts, the different people that are really passionate about sustainability, and that all they're gathered in the same place, and you can all speak the same language. And I'm not talking about English or Spanish, and I'm talking about green, which is fantastic because sometimes. Here in Peru, I, I would get really excited about something and people just, would just look at me like, okay, she's a weirdo. But when you go to Greenville or any other of these events, then you are just one more weirdo <laughs> in a whole of weirdos. But yeah, those events are really great for networking. They're also fantastic to learn about things that have worked in some projects and some countries. And actually... Something that's been my personal favorite is that I've started to hear a lot of conferences where they include not only the successful cases, but the failures. And I think it's really important to know what didn't work so that you avoid that or that you take that into consideration when you do different types of projects. I think that's really, really interesting. No, you're right. I mean, networking, as, as much as the, the courses, the sessions at a Green Build or any other conference uh, can be very valuable, some tips. It's You, you want to build your network, not for the, hey, I need something, just for the encouragement. Just, hey, how did you handle that maybe in your part of the world? And it's really just uh, important to share and compare notes with like-minded uh, sustainability professionals. So I, I second that, Fran, for sure. Every right. time I come back from Green Build, it's like like a boost of energy, green energy, of course. And I feel like, okay, I just want to go back home and start working. It's really refreshing. You get very energized. You realize we are making a difference and we do have influence over these buildings. So let's talk uh, a little bit about uh, books. I don't know if you prefer maybe reading books, uh, hard copy or, or audible. I, I listen to a lot of a lot of books. You know, have you read any uh, books recently you'd recommend? Yeah, actually, I've been reading the, um, I think it's, I think it's called Going Green or On Greening. 
which yeah. is, I think David Godfrey actually wrote it. I have it on my nightstand. I, I don't have it uh, right here, hard copy. But um, I'm about to finish that work, and it's about how the green building movement started in the U.S. and actually how the U.S. USDC started. And I feel related to all of the effort they did at the beginning, all the meetings they had to go with, all of the different things they had to talk to with different companies in order to get them to believe into the green building councils. So for me, it's like, of course, a very personal book because I feel like we are kind of in the same, go, going through the same thing, although, of course, different realities. But that's a really good book, and I definitely recommend it. It's actually a really easy read, and it's funny, and it's just not very technical. I just think it's fantastic. I'm not it's sure if it's green or all green. I think it's called Explosion Green. Yes. And uh, by David Gaff, just that, that early... Hey, how did all this movement start? And it's it's yes. good to know where those roots are. So, uh, explosion green. That's, uh, that's yeah, cool. really funny anecdotes and a very interesting story. So you wouldn't even believe it's a great. Okay. All right. So we're getting to know each other a little more as we're doing more education work together. But uh, I'm a fan of the bucket list, and so mine might have some adventure, some travel. Uh, a lot of different things on the bucket list, but what are war, one or two things you still want to accomplish that you're excited about? Uh, do you have anything on your bucket list? Professionally or personally? Uh, how about one of each? How about one personal item, one professional? Maybe maybe you really, uh, uh, maybe you have one of each you could share. What, what are you really working towards that really excites you? It could be something small or something big. Yeah, definitely. Something I'm actually on the working on right now is um, we work with the different ministries in the country. Um, we're now working with environment and the Ministry of Construction. And we launched in the year 2015 the Peruvian National Code for Sustainable Construction, but it's voluntary, so almost nobody uses it. So I would say like a little dream of mine is that that uh, code becomes mandatory at least for, I don't know, public sector buildings or something. But for it to become mandatory, that would mean like a 100% change on the way things are done here in Peru when you talk about sustainable construction, of course. That's a big goal, and, and that can yeah. still happen. Don't, don't <laughs> lose hope. And, uh, you know, so many codes here in the United States, for example, I mean, they've been adapted, and, and they're they're changing, and, and it'll come with time. So don't. Don't lose hope there. Well, what about something on the personal side? Is there a certain place you want to travel to or something exciting you, you definitely want to do? Yeah, definitely. A personal goal of mine is to do a safari in Africa. Wow. <laughs> yeah, like I, I really like animals, like wild animals, like um, zebras, giraffes, lions. I've always really liked them. But it's just not enough going to the zoo and just looking at them through a cage. Like experiencing that, being in their environment, and I being the visitor, not them being the cages. I'll be like, that's actually a dream of mine that I would really, really like to accomplish first. <laughs> that is definitely a good bucket list item. I appreciate you sharing that. Far, um, a very far and expensive bucket list item. <laughs> right. You, you know what would, uh, would make you happy there? It's important to you on many different levels, and it's more likely to happen. Uh, so, I, again, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, well, <laughs> start to uh, wrap up here let's talk a little bit more about what's some advice maybe you wish you'd have received earlier in your career number one and number two is you know is there anything you'd uh, suggest to someone that's just now making a career out of green building so anything you wish you knew earlier in your career and then what would you give uh, what kind of tips would you give to someone that's just now getting into the green building movement i think that when i first started i thought like okay, so green buildings, this is so logical and it's such a good thing for the environment that everyone's just going to buy into it. And no, <laughs> actually nobody bought into it at the beginning. So maybe someone should have told me like, it's going to be extremely hard and you have to aim three times higher than what you're aiming for, for whatever thing you do, because you are going to have a hundred people like pulling you down. If I should have known that before, I don't know, that would have been better, but that's just something that would actually also tell someone just getting into the sustainability movement. 
it's very nice, very pretty, very logical, but it's very hard to get the um, people that actually invest on the projects and that actually are going to develop the projects to buy into sustainability if they haven't done it before, if they're new. And if you don't have the numbers to show them what the benefit is, then it's just going to be very, very hard. I would say uh, not only because you're in sustainability, you can't forget about like finance and all of that stuff. I would tell them, um, study finance. <laughs> oh. That's going to be your secret tool. No, thank you. That's good advice. I mean, you can't lose hope. It's going to be hard. If this is something <laughs> you're passionate about, obviously never give up. Surround yourself with like-minded people and uh, have more and more conversations. How about green buildings in particular? You're a leader in this green building movement, Fran, and you have several credentials. You've been exposed to a lot of projects. You speak, and uh, when you speak, you're encouraging others in the audience to maybe make a go of it and not to lose hope. Instead, we're making a big difference. So uh, someone that's just now getting into green buildings, how about one more piece of advice for them? Any credentials, for example, we've talked about EDGE in developing countries. Uh, Part of those listening, they definitely... Uh, may not go for lead, but they might want to use one of the other programs. You and I talked earlier about how some countries yeah. might benefit more from edge or now there's the big wellness movement. So maybe if it's not just lead, especially since you're applying green building best practices in another country besides the U.S., uh, what's what's really worked? If you're not going after the exact lead certification, what else uh, should people be doing first? I think definitely people need to be uh, very conscious that lead, it's an option. And there are many more more options. None of them are better than the other one. They're all different options. They're all better for specific types of projects. I would tell uh, people getting into the sustainability movement, the green building movement, that you always have to be aware of what's happening in your country and in other countries. And you have to keep on studying and keep on learning and investigating about all of the different tendencies and strategies and do not get buried with any specific certification system or any specific trend or any specific strategy or company. There's space for a lot of different things in our green hearts. (laughs) So do not have any like specific preferences. Of course, we have to avoid seeing competing systems, rating systems as competitors, but they need to complement each other and, and be, oh, this is better for this type of project, so this one's going to work perfectly for this one. And it has to be a balance, I think. Yeah. And what's worked very good in Peru is that as the Peru Rebuilding Council, we understand that perfectly, that there's different things for different people, for different projects, for different budgets, for different cities, for different everything. And we try to promote them all as equal but uh, we always try to identify what's best for each specific situation. And I think people are starting to understand that and they're actually starting to like the movement a lot more because now they see a lot of variety and they see this is not only like um, a high-end thing, green buildings, but it's a thing for everyone. And for example, I'm sorry, I'm talking so much, but... um, have a big issue here in Peru about informality, but also on social living and um, what's the right word? Uh, housing that are not very expensive. Yeah, just the uh, you know equitable housing. I mean, just uh, affordable housing. Exactly, affordable housing, and that's a big issue for our country. And um, it's very important for us to identify what the best strategy is to approach those types of projects and what the best tool is for them to implement. And once everyone starts to understand this concept that sustainability is for everyone, then I think things will go much easier and much faster as well. No, that's great advice. And you're right. I, I think the rating systems like LEED, might, LEED version 4 might ta- start talking about affordable housing, but... You know, we might not see it here in the U.S., so it's great to have you on as a guest to let us know that, no, this is still an issue, not just in some parts of the U.S., but in many parts of the world. So I like what you said, though, Fran, is it has to become more of a a way of life for when we design and build and operate our buildings. It's not just about the certification and the plaque. So, well, just thank you for being on with us today. I really 
I uh, just enjoyed the conversation and just the big green heart you have. And I can't wait to hear you speak again. But Fran, thanks for being on with us. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. At GBES.com, our mission is to advance the green building movement through best-in-class education and encouragement. Remember, you can go to GBES.com slash podcast for any notes and links that we mentioned in today's episode. And you can actually see the other episodes that have already been recorded with our amazing guests. Please tell your friends about this podcast. Tell your colleagues And if you really enjoyed it, leave a positive review on iTunes. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on next week's episode.